Good morning, friends. I am hopeful that this is one of the last mornings we'll have to gather together in this way, as we now have the technology, the equipment, and sort of know how to stream our worship service live. Just in case it doesn't work, I bring you this taped service on YouTube, but I'm hoping that soon we will be able to work to get worship together in spirit at the same time even though not face to face let's get ready to worship god think about his love think about his goodness think about his grace that brought us through for as high as the heavens above so great is the measure of our father's love great is the measure of our father's love sing of god's mercy and grace sing of god's strength and might Praise God with laughter and joy. Praise God with feasting and dance. For God protects the lowly and avenges the misdeeds of the mighty. God brings forth justice and righteousness, saving the weak from the cruelty of the powerful. Sing of God's mercy and grace. Sing of God's strength and might. Come, let us worship God and let us pray together. Gracious God, renew our minds with the power of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse our spirits with your mercy and grace. Bring us into fellowship with one another and grant us courage to defend the lowly. Part the waters of our troubled thoughts that we might see others as you see them. Protect us with your powerful hand that we might sing of your faithfulness and dance to your glory. Amen. It is good as we prepare to hear the word of God and to encounter that word that we gather together our hearts in confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we are ever in need of your grace and mercy. When we have injured your little ones, forgive us. When we have laughed at others' misfortunes, pardon us. When we have belittled the weak, humble us. Help us walk the trials of life with your powerful hope and your loving grace. Amen. And these words do indeed assure us. Dance and sing to the Lord, whose gracious love for all of his children never ends. Now hear the word of God. As it was recorded in Matthew, it's an encounter between Peter and Jesus with people looking on. It comes at a time in the church when the early followers of Jesus were jockeying a little bit to figure out who was best, who was more powerful, who was most important. Hear how Jesus answers Peter's question. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And not included in the scripture, I give you this explanation. 70 times seven is an unimaginably large number. Bigger than any number that anyone had encountered. Back to the scripture. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As it began the settlement, a man who owed him 10 thousand bags of gold, which in another editorial note is more money than anybody would ever learn, earn in a normal lifetime at that time. Now back to the scripture, was brought to him since he was not able to pay. The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and that all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. 
But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But it refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And another editorial note, if you're in prison, you can't earn money to repay a debt that is larger than anyone could pay, could earn in a lifetime. So basically he was given a life sentence. This, back to the scripture, is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Sometimes all we need is a good story. And I am grateful to my friends at Homiletics for sharing this story with me this Sunday so I can share it with you. Now, if we were in the sanctuary, this is where I would get in my rocking chair and I would rock as I tell. But this is YouTube, so I'm going to read. He was the kind of villain that we love to hate in the movies. But this was no movie. It was the city of Rome under Nazi rule during the Second World War. Our villain is Colonel Hermann Kapler commander of the SS forces occupying Rome. As villains go, he had a pretty impressive resume. Upon the occupation of Rome, the Gestapo demanded a multi-million dollar ransom for the lives of the Jews living in Rome. With the help of Pope Pius XII, the chief rabbi of Rome raised the money within 24 hours, but the Nazis weren't satisfied and under Kapler's supervision, began to herd the Jews away in cattle trucks and wagons bound for the concentration camps. Kapler's SS routinely tortured and executed suspected members of the resistance. When a bomb planted by the militant communist underground killed 32 Roman soldiers, German soldiers in Rome, Kapler responded by randomly selecting 320 mostly civilian prisoners for slaughter, a 10 to 1 reprisal, including political prisoners, petty thieves, and prostitutes. They were bound, marched across the streets of Rome, herded onto trucks, and mowed down by machine gunfire in the Ardiantine caves. The entrances to the caves were blown up, sealing the dead and wounded behind hundreds of tons of rock. For all of his brutality, Kapler had not been able to capture the man who was behind the massive underground network that aided escaped allied PS POWs and Jews in Rome. Kapler knew who the man was, but there was a problem. He was a Vatican priest. As long as he remained on neutral Vatican territory, Kapler, even in all of his power, couldn't touch him. But this tough Irish priest was not the staying in the neutral territory type of person. Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty was a tall, broad-shouldered, accomplished amateur boxer who didn't ever run away from a fight. Through his wit and his impressive golf game, he had won over many of Rome's elite and was unlikely to sit out the war and allow his contacts to go unused. So Kapler had O'Flaherty watched and finally 
on one brilliant sunny winter morning, he thought he had him cornered. The Nazi SS had the palazzo of Prince Filippo Doria Pazzilli surrounded. O'Flaherty was inside. Colonel Kapler stepped out of his black limousine to personally apprehend this thorn in his side, this troublesome priest. O'Flaherty raced down a narrow stone staircase into the cellar. No way out, nowhere to hide. The Germans were in the building now. He could hear them yelling upstairs. They'd pull the place apart looking for him and would burst into the cellar in moments. Too much was at stake for too many people for him to surrender to Kapler now, especially for Prince Filippo and the others upstairs who were compromised by O'Flaherty's presence. If he could somehow escape, the Nazis wouldn't be able to prove that he had been there and would be forced to let the matter drop. As he edged along the passageway that led to the cellar beneath the courtyard, he noticed a strange sound of rocks rolling down the stone mountain face. As he moved closer to the sound, he saw a light, daylight. The prince's winter coal supply was sliding into the coal bin and through a trap door in the courtyard. O'Flaherty scrambled up the pile of shifting coal and stuck his head out of the trap door. Two Italian coalsmen were between him and the courtyard gates, where the SS troops were keeping watch for him. The coal truck was parked outside the gates. O'Flaherty took off his black Monsignor's robe, and he put them into an empty coal sack. His, he tore his collarless shirt to the waist, and rubbed coal dust all over himself from head to toe. With the cooperation of one of the coal men who had no love for the Nazis, O'Flaherty strolled, stro strolled right past the two lines of SS troops who disdainfully gave him a wide berth so that they wouldn't get their uniforms dirty. When he was out of the soldier's sight, he took his priestly robe and hat out of the coal sack slung over his shoulder, tucked them under his arm, and rushed to the nearest church, where he cleaned up and set off for the safety again of the Vatican. After several hours, he called Prince Filippo, who said that everyone was safe and that Kapler was furious. A few months earlier, this Catholic priest from Neutra, Ireland, working in the neutral Vatican city-state during the Second World War, would never have imagined being in this kind of a predicament. He had grown up as an IRA sympathizer in Ireland who detested the British. As a result, in the early years of the war, he dismissed accounts of German atrocities as Allied propaganda. I read the propaganda on both sides, he would say, and I don't believe much of it. I don't think there is anything to choose between Britain and Germany. And so O'Flaherty's efforts to aid escaping Allied POWs could just as easily have been made on behalf of escaping Nazi POWs if he had been in the midst of the Allied occupation. Initially, he was simply helping souls in need. But the sight of the Nazis carting away German, Roman Jews in 1943 made it impossible for O'Flaherty to continue to be neutral. The Nazis' treatment of the Roman Jews transformed O'Flaherty, who in turn transformed his fledgling informal network of contacts into a massive partisan effort to save as many Allied soldiers and Roman Jews as was possible. He came to understand that the Nazis had to be defeated. As a result, this Irishman who detested the British saved more Allied lives than any other single person 
in World War II. More British than any other nationality. His efforts earned him the nickname the Scarlet Pimpernel of the Vatican, and he was decorated, ironically, a commander of the British Empire. Kepler and O'Flaherty played a life and death cat and mouse game in which O'Flaherty always managed to stay just one step ahead of his arch nemesis. In frustration, Kepler even attended to have the Irish priest forcibly dragged off the neutral Vatican territory and, ass and assassinated. O'Flaherty's network got wind of the plan and arranged instead for the two Gestapo assassins to receive a good beating at the hands of four Swiss guards. The bitter rivalry between this German Nazi and this Irish priest set the stage for O'Flaherty's most remarkable re rescue. After the war, Colonel Kapler was tried and convicted for war crimes. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for his part in the slaughter of the 320 innocent people at the Ardiantine Caves. Over 50 years later, our popular imagination still strains to contrive a villain more detestable than a Nazi war criminal who sent Jews to concentration camps and tortured and murdered innocent civilians. Imagine the hatred of those who actually experienced his evil. The hatred we might feel today for like Timothy McVeigh or the Oklahoma City bombers or the, the pilots of the, of, the, of the airplanes that hit the Twin Towers. People who have acted so inhumanely that it takes our breath away. Or maybe the stakes are more personal. Maybe it's our hatred for that vicious gossip at work or next door, or that pedophile at the local elementary school, or for that no good son-in-law who treats your daughter abusively, or for that person that cut you off as you were turning from Watson on to Houston Lake Road. It's the righteous hatred we feel when we know we're right, when we know that someone else has done something wrong, when we're certain that he owes us or our loved ones or society something. It is the hatred of the unforgiving servant who throttles his fellow servant and has him thrown in jail. Let him rot till he's paid me back. Only one person ever visited Kapler in prison. For years, almost every month, a tall, broad-shouldered figure of a man would call on the former Nazi. It was the Scarlet Pimpernel of the Vatican. Monsignor, you or Flaherty on a dis different kind of rescue mission, reaching out to a soul in need. More than most of us, this tough Irishman had the courage to fight evil and to seek justice at tremendous personal risk. But he also knew that we are all called to love our enemies and that even villains need mercy. Peter came up to Jesus that day and said, Lord, when my brother wrongs me, how, must, how often must I forgive him? Seventy times? No, Jesus said. Not seven times. I say seventy times seven. Forgiveness is not saying the offense never happened. Because it did. Forgiveness is not saying that everything's okay. Because it's not. Forgiveness is not saying we no longer feel the pain of what was done to us. We do. For Father O'Flaherty, forgiveness was saying, I still feel the pain, but I am willing to let go of your involvement in my pain. For Father O'Flaherty, forgiveness was an attitude of faith 
where he was able to turn over to God about the business the other guy was doing. Her father O'Flaherty forgiveness was saying to Kapler, I'm okay and I am willing to let God deal with whether you are okay and I am willing to let go of my need to be an instrument of correction or rebuke in your life. In fact, Father O'Flaherty continued to visit Kapler and show him the love of Christ. In March 1959, Herman Kapler, formal SS Colonel, Nazi war criminal, sought forgiveness and salvation in the waters of baptism poured by the hand of Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. A good story for us to remember in a time when the call for forgiveness needs to be great and our willingness to be gracious needs to be even greater. Let's pray together. Where charity and love are, God is there. Christ's love has gathered us into one. Let us rejoice and be pleased in him. Let us fear and let us love the living God. May we love each other with a sincere heart. Where charity and love are, God is there. As we are gathered into one body, beware lest we be divided in mind. Let evil impulses stop. Let controversy cease. And may Christ our God be in our midst. Where charity and love are, God is there. And may we with the saints also see the face of glory of Christ our Lord, the joy that is immense and good unto the ages through the infinite ages. For we pray this in the name of Christ who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. May God give us his sustaining power and grant us the strengthening presence of his spirit in whatever challenges await us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord.